Arthur Diabo, United States Marine Corps, Vietnam. Arthur is a Canadian. He was living in Brooklyn, New York at this time of his service in Vietnam. His family was living in Brooklyn, New York, and he served in Vietnam in 1968. He was a fire team leader. He was wounded twice during his service in Vietnam and saw a lot of combat. He suffers today with PTSD, as a lot of the Vietnam veterans do. So he has a very unique perspective of what happened in Vietnam. Again, he was considered as one of the Canadians that came down from Canada to serve with the American forces. And he went to Paris Island for his basic training and went to Camp Lejeune and Camp Pendleton for advanced infantry training. He was an 0311, which is an infantryman. But Arthur's story, God bless him, he tells a great story of of what happened when he was 18, 19, 20 years old and serving our country. He was living in this country, but he is, like I said, he's a Canadian citizen. So one of the few Vietnam stories we have of the Canadians who served here in the United States. So I'd like to thank Mike Bench, Michael Nally, and James Holt for making it possible for you to hear Arthur's story today. Gentlemen, I salute you. I look in the camera and say thank you. God bless you, and I'm just happy that you're there and have taken a step to help support my work, and um, I'm, I'm really grateful. So are the families of these veterans that are watching these stories, and our younger generations the better, too. So, gentlemen, thank you very much. Okay, Arthur Diablo, what a, what a great story. He's a North American Indian, by the way. He's one of the few stories that I have of, a, of an American Indian, a North American Indian. And uh, it just, uh, you'll, you'll love it. It's just a great story. I hope that this really, you can share the story. This is really my first Canadian story that I've shared. Um, I have many stories from Canada and I've had Canadians comment on some of my videos. I would appreciate hearing from more of you and uh, we can get these stories out there. If you'd like to sponsor a story like these gentlemen have done, I would like to encourage you to think about it, to do so. It's a great project, folks. It's, it's a, it's a feel-good project. This is a labor of love. There's many, many hours of work that goes behind the scenes to bring these stories to you, and um, your, your sponsorship will help with that. If you'd like to donate to my work, you can do so by the comment section of the video. And below the video is a video description. You can click on a link, and you can help sponsor a veteran, or go to my website, LarryCapetto.com, and click on Sponsor a Vet. My heart's full as I share these stories. I'm excited for you to watch Arthur's story. It's, it's an amazing story, and uh, I think you'll really enjoy it. So share these videos, folks. Subscribe to this channel. Let's keep this thing going. God bless you. Just turned 60. 60? Is that old? That's the average age of the Vietnam veterans. You're actually, you're just a tad bit on the young side there. Um, now, the story that's interesting to me, what I wanted to talk to you is uh, the Canadians didn't fight in Vietnam, but a lot of them went down to the States and fight. Is that what you found yourself doing in the 60s? Well, actually, um, my parents and my dad relocated the family to Brooklyn, New York in the early part of the 60s. Okay. He was a construction iron worker and worked on the Verrazano Narrows Bridge, all the major construction sites in New York. So rather than him travel every week, he just relocated the whole family there. Okay. So uh, I got there when I was 12. I went to school till I was 17. I did some work for a few months till I turned 18. And then I enlisted in the Marines. In New York? In New York. Now, were you living in the States at the time? Or were you a Canadian citizen? Well, I have a special status as a North American Indian. Okay. 
We travel unobstructed across the borders. Okay. That's our right and a privilege. Okay, gotcha. So, so you went there's no problem with me being there. So you went into the Marine Corps? That's correct. Basic training, Paris Island maybe? Paris Island 67. Do you remember your first day boot camp? How can you forget? <laughs> Did you have to put your feet on those yellow footprints or what have you? I put my feet on the yellow footprints. I did whatever they told me to do because I was brief before. They tell you to jump, you ask how high. You're a good Marine, eh? Was well, a Marine always a Marine? <laughs> Try to be. Yeah. So you went to basic training. What happened after basic training? Basic training, uh, infantry training in Camp Lejeune, North Carolina. Uh, we had an early Christmas, New Year's in 1968, so we were released earlier so we could be home for Christmas. So I spent Christmas and New Year's with my family in New York and then I left for Cal Camp Pendleton, California for another month of uh, advanced, training? advanced infantry training. And from there we got our orders to for Vietnam. Uh, we left uh, California to Okinawa and we landed in a monsoon, so we had to wait, wait a few days before we caught another flight to Vietnam. And when did you end up in Vietnam? What month and year? Do you remember? Just at the end of January, January 68, and uh, which was, I wasn't aware of it at the time, which was a bad time in Vietnam because of the Tet Offensive. We didn't know it. It was just that when we got to our infantry units, uh, a lot of the people weren't there. We were replacement uh, Marines for the Marines who either got killed or wounded in the operation before we got there. Basically, I got there and we had a complete empty tent and there was five or six of us who got there. So uh, we asked, you know, where's, where's the rest of the people? And he said, well, they're gonna be coming back slow but sure, they'll, they'll filter in. And it took a while, at least two weeks, before we got a good contingent of Marines to, that were um, ready to go back on duty, uh, to do the operations, to do the fighting, and to orient us, the new guys. Now, where were you living during this time, in the States or in Canada? I was living in Brooklyn, New York. Okay. My family was there in Brooklyn, New York. Tell me about your first engagement in combat. Do you remember that day, or the, what were you doing? Where were you, and what were you doing? There weren't any immediate uh, big operations, combat operations. It was mostly people stepping on landmines, booby traps, things of that sort, uh, uh, small exchanges of fire, being sniped at, and you know, chasing the enemy around. It wasn't until May when I seen my major combat, which is uh, on Hill 1192 adjacent to the Haivon Pass on Highway 1. We inadvertently walked into an enemy base camp and they let us walk in and then they surrounded us and we were under a siege for five days. And a lot of combat, a lot of trauma. Um, I've seen a lot of people do brave and stupid things. And uh, my focus then was just to stay alive, to get through and get off that godforsaken hill. Well, that wasn't Hamburger Hill, was it? No, Hamburger Hill was an arm, uh, army operation up in the Asha Valley. This was a uh, marine operation to, um, to reestablish contact and open Highway 1 for uh, supplies from Da Nang to Way City. And it was our responsibility to open Highway 1 after Tet because the enemy had dug it up and made it impassable. So you're fighting the North Vietnamese or the Viet Cong? Both. Both. The base camp that we ran into was a North Vietnamese base camp high on top of this hill. Um, I guess division knew it was there. It's just that they had to send up people to make sure if there was people there. And sure enough, there was. So was combat what you thought it would be? Was it, I mean, you, you can learn about it, train for it, but I'm sure there's things you learn during the combat that you can't learn elsewise. 
No, the, uh, you expect nothing can prepare you for combat at that level. Uh, in the beginning, I had a lot of expectations. I was gung-ho. I wanted to get in there. I wanted to, to hurt people. I wanted to shoot. But you sort of you, you forget that they shoot back, and they want to do the same thing that you're, going, you're there to do to them. So it sort of turns the table a little bit. What, do you ever, did you ever feel invincible, like nothing can happen to you? After boot camp, you know, after all the training, the physical fitness, and you're Superman, and uh, when I first got to Vietnam, I was really itching to get into a fight, and the small skirmishes that we had, you know, you had, uh, you can call in artillery and air, you know, just uh, that simple and blow away a whole village, a whole tree line, you know, whether it's called for or not. But uh, that's a lot of power. And you have a lot of young Marines with dangerous weapons, weapons designed to kill. And you just can't wait to start locking, loading, and opening fire. So this May of 68, um, Hill 1162, did you say, or 92? This battle, 11, 1192. This battle that you're fighting. Um, was it exchange of small arms fire, artillery, hand-to-hand? -hand? What was it? Well, you got to remember, we walked into a base camp, mm -hmm. and they didn't know we were coming. Yeah. So as we came down the hill, they assaulted us and ambushed us and let us walk into their camp. And then they surrounded the camp, so we couldn't get out. So it was really hard for us. We were fighting defensively. Uh, taking a lot of hits by snipers, constantly fighting skirmishes, going from one scene to another, and the wear and tear of the situation. A lot of people getting hit, dying, being wounded, dying of their wounds, and us being unable to medevac them. No water, no food. Being that it was a base camp, we had their kitchens and we had their water, but their food is not too good. But we had uh, supplies on, on station, helicopters dropping stuff to us. Most, most of the stuff didn't get to us, dropped outside our lines. Uh, we, we got most of the ammunition that we needed, but we weren't getting the food supplies. But that was just the second thought. We weren't hungry, we weren't all that hungry. It was just... Did this last a day, a week? Five days. How many men do you think you lost? We had a company, I would say, of 120 men, more or less. Um, I had a squad. I didn't, I didn't have a squad. I was in a squad of seven men. I was a, um, a fire team leader. Uh, I was in charge of three men. And at the end of that, the fight on that hill, I was by myself. I had no more men. I had no more squad. That's... It didn't take long to lose a lot of men. And you were the, the squad leader, did you say? No, I was a, a fire team leader. Okay. There's three fire teams per squad. I was a team leader. But uh, after that five-day uh, experience on the hill, there was no more squad and no more team. I was probably the only survivor of that squad. So how do you get through the difficult situations? Is it your training, your faith? How do you get through it? I would say training. Uh, you don't sleep, and I, I can't remember sleeping there. And if I did, it was only small cat naps, minutes at a time. And when it gets really dark there, it's dark. You can't see anything, so you have some downtime. But you're basically 100% hyper alert. And after May and into June, uh, I was always hyper alert. First time I was hit was on the hill. I took shrapnel to my hand and to my knee. And I was medevac towards the end on the fifth, sixth day, if I remember, when a uh, sister um, company came to, our, uh, came to our rescue and the siege was ended. So we had helicopters who uh, came in, did the medevacs, did the evacs of the... Uh, 
uh, the wounded. And uh, I, I was probably one of the last or the few to get medevac by a, an Air Force, Air Force helicopter, if I remember. <clears throat> and you were, that was the end of your tour? No, I was, uh, I was shipped to Charlie Med in Da Nang. Mm -hmm. And from Da Nang, I went to Cameron Bay okay. for a week of R&R, uh, &R, basically to uh, recover from the wounds. Mm -hmm. And after that week or week and a half, if I remember, I was shipped back to my unit up north and rejoined them on another operation that they were on, just as bad as the hill. Uh, so it just didn't stop? No, no, it, it was nonstop. We were uh, choppered in and we couldn't land because the LZs were too hot. And uh, so we were taken back to the staging area. We were there overnight and we were hella lifted again in the morning. Let me ask you, it's been, it's been many years, but one of the things that intrigues me about the Higgins boats, the Huey helicopters, the, the assaults, it's, it's just the mentality going into a, like a hot LZ. I mean, what goes through your head? Is it fat, does it happen too quick? Are you fearful? Are you, what, are you, what are your thoughts when you're, like, let's say you're headed for a hot LZ? What's going through your head? Knowing you're going to be dropped off? And well, I'd be lying if I said I wasn't afraid. You're afraid. Uh, you're just hoping that it's not going to be your day. And, uh, are, you, are you hardened though at this point? Are you like a hardened veteran? You're kind of callous to the situation, or are you raw like a new a newbie in in in, in country? Are you talking to the other guys? What's going on in the helicopter? You're basically with a bunch of marine grunts who are already hardened, 18, 19 years old, and caught, acting like they're 30, mature for their age. Uh, is there a seriousness, or is it just kidding around, or is it just everybody's real serious? There's a, there's a lot of gallows humor, but being hyper alert as you get close to the LZ, you're just hoping that it's not hot, and if it is hot, you know, get off that chopper as soon as you can. And a lot of times it's jumping off while it's still moving. In uh, my instance, it was, uh, it was a good LZ, it was already established, and it wasn't hot like it was the day before. And when I say hot, I mean firing and fighting. Yeah. Of course, the heat and the humidity is the second hotness. That adds to your misery. So, again, these questions, uh, so many stories over the years and just listening to you now, here it comes again. Um, you, what was your MOS again? What was your job in the Corps? I was a Marine Basic Infantryman. My MOS is 0311 which is Marine Infantry. Well, every Marine's a rifleman, I hear, but so you were doing the job and carrying an M16? What are you carrying? I carried an M16 initially, and then I, car I carried um, uh, a blooper, which is a grenade launcher, and uh, I went back to a 16 the second time I got hit. How close did you ever get to the enemy? Like, as close as you are to me? Or was it a distance? Did you ever see their eyeballs? <laughs> Up on the hill in May, uh, we were sent to, uh, to uh, get a sniper that was giving us a, a hard time on our right flank. Mm -hmm. And as we crested the hill to go down to where the sniper was, he, uh, I, I shielded myself behind a teak tree because I had a big thin sticking out like a shield. And as I looked to see, you know, where where he was, where the fire was coming from, he pumped tree rounds to the fin of the tree. So I really, mind you, if I was this big back then, I wouldn't be here talking about it. But I, I seen where he was firing from, and so did the other guys, so they returned the fire. So we were playing um, sneak and peek. I'd look, and then I seen him. And I, I always remember he had a blue hat for some reason, a, bu a blue bush hat. And then he would fire more rounds my way. And then the guys behind me would return the fire. And at some point, somebody came up with a, um, uh, a rocket launcher, a law, and uh, fired into his position. And just, there was just a lot of smoke and debris all over the place. 
but a few of our guys were hit, so we had to get them and bring them back over the crest of the hill. And there was two guys that were down in my team, so down we're, we're, we were down to two people. Our squad leader was hit. So it was a, it was a depressing time, and that is clo as close as I ever got. And l looking him in the eye, no. But seeing him aiming my way, yes. He was trying to kill me, and we were trying to kill him. But he got the best of us. And uh, I got to give him uh, the NBA credit because they were well-trained, disciplined. They just had the upper hand because we were in their backyard at that time. The place was littered with spider holes. We couldn't find them, and when we did, they weren't in the hole. They would pop up in another hole. It was, just a, it was just really depressing, and now we're, we're down to our last rounds. We really have to watch. And whoever has more ammo has to share. This is what we do, we share. But it was critical, we, uh, we had no water, and we had to go outside our lines at night to the, to the stream that was coming by their mess hall and sneak the water. They couldn't see us, had we done it during the day, they wouldn't have allowed us to do that. So when you're in Vietnam like you were in combat, do your thoughts ever reflect upon fighting for God and country, or is it just survival? The, that ideology for God and country was never... Uh, boot camp, everything was anti-communism. Uh, get the people who are anti-American you know, establish the U.S. doctrine in Vietnam to save them from communism. It was always anti-communism, put an end to communism. Those were the big key words in those days. Yeah. Not like today. Today it's terrorism. But looking back though, you were serving your country. Yes, uh, it was something that I wanted to do. Uh, not that I needed to do it, but I just wanted to experience that. Did you say you were drafted? Yeah, that's another story. Were you drafted? Yeah. Okay. So you, you That's went. the end of the story, but I'll tell you. But you went, okay. So uh, this is May. I'm back with my unit in June. We're fighting, and we're back in the paddies, which is, yeah. it's easier to fight in the paddies than in the hills. So we're, we're fighting in the paddies. We ended a big operation. Uh, we had some downtime for two or three days, and then we kicked off another big operation. Day two into that operation, I was walking point and walked into an ambush we knew that was there. Marine Corps doctrine, you have to send out feelers to draw fire. And a lot of times you're hoping it's not your day, not your squad, and not you. But your, your ticket comes up and you got to go. And you do it without question. But that day, as I was walking down that rice paddy, and I could, I, I sense it wasn't right because I hear a lot of women screaming at their children in the ville ahead of us, about 150 meters to our front. And that, that's... That's unusual. Uh, I guess what they were doing was telling their kids to get in the bunkers because they knew what was going to happen. And as I got closer, I just I felt the hairs on the back of my neck pop up on my arms, and the whole tree line opened up. And instinctively, I just kicked myself into the rice paddy. And I'm in between the fire of the Marines behind me and the enemy to the front. The enemy is shooting, the Marines can't shoot back because they don't want to hit me. And I'm stuck in that rice paddy. I, uh, I have to make a split second decision. I either die there or die trying to get out of there. So I flip my pack, my helmet. I know where the Marines are to my rear. All I did was kick myself up and did the fastest running jog that but as I started to gather my momentum, I felt like somebody came and hit me with a bat in the back of my arm and actually helped me. It flipped me over the rice paddy in the back behind cover. But it also blew my arm almost off. 
but uh, your left arm here. my left arm here. And I thought I was dead, but I could still hear everything going on above me, the green tracers, the red tracers. Now the Marines can return fire behind me because now I'm out of the line of fire. But I, I can see that I can't move. I, I grab a hand grenade from my pocket, flip my hand back into a normal position and put it inside my, my, uh, my jacket pocket. And I start crawling along the dike towards the rear to where uh, the other Marines are. And they're, they're yelling at me where to go because I'm doing it backwards because I didn't want to see anybody coming after me. And I, I got to a junction in the rice paddy and I got tangled up in, uh, uh, we call them gook thorns. It's bamboo thorns and it's like fish hooks. Once they get into you, they tear you, tear you apart. But the Marines grabbed me and pulled me through that. Mm -hmm. I think I got more hurt from all those thorns than than uh, actually getting shot. But uh, they seen everything that happened. They knew what was going on. And uh, I, that's the best description I can give you. I know more now because I met the guys that uh, saved me, yeah. saved me at that point, brought me to the rear, and I was still holding my hand grenade, and uh, I wouldn't let it go. But they, they had to pry it from my hand because I already had... Uh, pulled a pin on it. But that was my million dollar wound that was sending me home. So for the five and a half months I was in Vietnam, I was wounded twice, once in May, and three weeks later in June. May 9th and June the 14th. I don't know what the time. So that's, uh, I, I went from being gung-ho in February to really wanting to get out of Vietnam. But I was going to do my time. Uh, I never thought about getting killed. The thought always was in the back of my mind about getting wounded, but my worst fear was getting captured because we knew how they treat the Marines and vice versa. But uh, So what happened to your arm? You break it, you lose some of the mobility of it? It actually, the... Uh, the bullet went through the front and blew out the back. So I had what you call as a compound open fracture. You could see the bones and the missing bone and just the, uh, the muscle and the flesh that was there. And uh, my immediate reaction is I'm going to lose my arm, which was okay with me. I knew it's, there, there's no way it can be fixed. But when I got to uh, Da Nang and to uh, Charlie Med, there were doctors there, these Navy doctors, who were really cocky, and he says, we're going to save your arm. I says, no, you can't look at it. He says, we're going to save your arm. Yeah. But we've got to get you back to the States as soon as possible. We're going to fix you up and get you back to the States, and that's where they're going to fix your arm for you. Well, I'm happy. If they could save it, fine. If not, that's okay, too. It's not the worst thing in the world. But at least I'm going home. My tour of duty in Vietnam is finished. You feel any? Uh, how long were you over there before you came home? Months, or weeks, or days, or what? Well, I got there the the end of January. Oh, after you were wounded. After I'm wounded. After you hurt your arm, did they send you right back home? I spent a night in Da Nang. Okay. They flew us out to Japan. I stayed uh, one night there, and from Japan, we got air vac directly back to the United States. Did you feel guilty leaving your your men, or how'd you feel? First time I was wounded, I was guilty. The second time, there was no guilt associated with it. It was only during the healing process that I, I started to feel a tremendous sense of guilt because uh, only wanting to know who made it, who made it true. And I was only to find out years later, actually eight years ago. I met, uh, I met a few of them at a reunion and I was shocked to see them and that they were still alive and that they're okay. Wow. Yeah, that's not many of them, but. So when you came home, you were wounded, but was there, a, you probably went right to a hospital, but you hear some horror stories of homecomings for Vietnam vets. I'm assuming you didn't have to face all that. 
No, no. We, uh, we were flown in. We were bussed into the hospital. Uh, the care was just outstanding and tremendous. We had the best quality of care. But you have a bunch of young people who are physically wounded, missing limbs, in an orthopedic ward, and frustrated, mad, a lot of them in the depressed about their circumstances. Some happy to be home, others not. They just want to go someplace else and other than home. Uh, the 60s was a lot of drugs, especially in the hospitals. Uh, really? Oh, what, what, what you couldn't get prescribed, you could get black market right in the hospital. For free, it was like jelly beans. Maybe that was an attempt just to keep us quiet because we were a boisterous and angry bunch. And later on into the Veterans Hospital, the same thing. They were not prepared for a generation such as that. Uh, basically, that's it. The rest of the time, 68, a lot of 69 was just recuperating, operations, operations gone bad and doing the same operation again because I had a really bad rice paddy infection and the first bone grafts wouldn't take, they got infected again, so they had to redo it all over and uh, the grafting from one hip and then grafting from the other hip, grafting from my chest to do the flap to cover the hole. And when the graft took to open it and do the bone grafts and to do the push rods, and the doctor said they were gonna save my arm and they did. I mean, it doesn't look pretty, but it's very functional. I can do a lot of things with it. And I, was, I told myself I wasn't gonna be dependent on an apparatus. You know, I was uh, still able to walk well, but all the other things over the years that came with the psychological trauma. Do you suffer from post-traumatic stress? Yes, I do. Like, is there a disability for that? Yes, there is. Um, I, uh, I received compensation for uh, PTSD, uh, now diabetes because of the Agent Orange. And right now the diabetes is a hell of a lot worse than the PTSD and the physical wounds because it's slowly progressing. And, you have uh, dialysis or anything? Or? No, no, I'm, I'm insulin dependent. It's just like even walking here today, my, the uh, diabetic foot uh, neuropathy really hurts. <laughs> if you gotta walk on cement, and uh, I felt it coming up. A uh, lot of things associated with, but over the years, I just wanted to try and reestablish uh, contact with my buddies that I left behind. And it was hard in the beginning because there was no internet back then. Uh, you tried to look in magazines and you know veterans organizations. There, there was just nothing out there to network and how to find people. Eventually you could if you spent a lot of time just doing that. But as soon as the internet opened up, it was easy to find people and they found me. I didn't have to go looking. Now, you found out about my work through the newspaper, right? Uh, through the newspaper, and it went online. I have a friend who, uh, who used a new newspaper clipping and sent it out to the, uh, uh, to the veterans in the area, the Montreal area. Sent the clipping of my story? Of your story, right. Okay. And why do you think you called me? Did you just want to talk about it, or you've never talked about it before, or what? Well, I, I've talked about it in the past, but uh, there was a time in Canada, particularly in the Montreal area, when it wasn't popular to be a Vietnam vet. Uh, we, we, a group of Vietnam veterans were trying to establish or to get U.S. veterans benefits for us here in Canada which was not applicable to us. It was okay for the World War II and Korean veterans, but not for Vietnam veterans. We just wanted the same treatment and benefits. It took a while and a lot of fighting and a lot of publicity, but out of that publicity, we got negative reaction. I used to get hate mail, 
in Montreal. But you got to remember, there was a lot of draft dodgers, war resistors who are still here today and bear a lot of resentment towards the United States and the veterans who may have fought, fought there. I think it's a shame that the Canadians don't recognize the Vietnam vets that fought uh, from this country. Um, well, they call it the silent war, Canada's silent war, something like that. One of the reasons I'm here today is now the tide has turned. Canada is experiencing the same thing with their veterans. And uh, what was established in the area of uh, post-traumatic stress really came out of the Viet Vietnam experience. So what the Canadian soldiers are experiencing today in Afghanistan, Canadian and American, was part of what we experienced and what we fought for for um, and psychological trauma and PTSD to get it better recognized and treated. Yeah. And uh, we, we were receiving quality services here to a, for a while. And then the, the movement died down because the guys are getting old now and they're, uh, they're not as energetic. I uh, know I'm, I'm not. I, uh, I tire very easily. But uh, what's happening now sort of supports what we did 25, 30 years ago. Art, what should Canada and the United States or the world remember about Vietnam? I guess because it was the war that was fought in your living room as opposed to previous wars where you only seen the positive side of war when United States is winning, World War II, Korea, but in Vietnam it wasn't the same. When we were losing, you seen the losses on TV. And that sort of changed the, uh, the, the opinion and the tide of the war back in 68. And part of Walter Cronkite's legacy is due to that. And uh, at least he was honest and upfront about it. But uh, the media, the first-hand accounts, the media being there, and a lot of media, you know, that's, uh, and then getting into a situation that you ultimately can win militarily, but not politically, this I understand now, but not back then. Everything was indoctrinated, uh, communism, kill communists, no matter who they are, where they are, we have to terminate them to save the world from communism and make it free for everyone. Define combat. What would your definition of combat be? For me personally, it's, uh, it was my awakening that uh, I wanted to do something with my life, something productive, to travel. The Marines offered that opportunity. And I, I guess like any 18-year-old, and uh, particularly in my community, I come from a Mohawk community just across the river here, and the majority of our young men joined the Marines for some reason. For some reason, we supply 15% of the recruiting pool for the Marine Corps recruiter in Plattsburgh, New York at that time, 15% when they could be relying on more of the county. But uh, I saw it as a rite of passage for me. You know, I wanted to prove myself, combat, because there was a lot of things that I was fearful about in, uh, about maturing and getting old and not experiencing life. And, and, and combat sort of answered some of that, not some, a lot of it. What does freedom mean to you? Because we were in a country where people who aren't free, who, who fear speaking out, who can't eat the way they, they could, uh, Freedom means rights, not having rights. And uh,
I have a difficult time with that because I hear the same thing today in the media. The, the young soldiers in Afghanistan are asking, what are they fighting for? And they're saying, so this country can be free. Free of what? There's tyranny there. It's still going to be there whether you're here or not fighting for it. And I, I, can, uh, I have a lot of empathy for that because I, I went from warmonger to pacifist over this period of time. Uh, I've experienced war and I wouldn't want my son to go to war or any member of my family or any person for that matter to go to war. Yeah. Only because of my experience. Are you proud to be a Vietnam veteran? Yes, I am. Do people thank you for what you've done? A few. Uh, the government was really thankful because after I was uh, discharged from the uh, Marines, I ended up in a VA hospital. And uh, my first furlough home in Brooklyn, New York, I got, I got home and there was a draft, uh, <laughs> a draft notice waiting for me. <laughs> I sort of got a double whammy, you know. I said, well, if they want me that back, I'll go back. But, yeah, you know, I, I, I knew what happened. I, when I graduated from school, I didn't tell them where I was because I enlisted immediately in the Marines. So they thought I was just hiding all over New York trying to avoid them. Yeah. But the draft notice was real. Uh, I called a congressman at the time, and the, uh, he called the draft board. And he says, well, I'm going to go to the Daily News with this because this would make a good, interesting story. <laughs> and he says, no, tear it up. <laughs> tear up your draft notice. Anyway, I was, I was doing a lot of things at that time. I was just using it as a giggle to get a laugh out of it. But uh, if they wanted me that bad, I would have went back. I still felt the hole at that point. The only thing holding me back was my arm. And I would have went back. So, are you doing good today? Yeah, life's been good. Uh, I eventually married. I, I have a son, two grandchildren. I went back to school. Uh, I got back into the job market, but I never... Uh, uh, I started having physical difficulties and then the psychological effects. I started seeing a doctor here and... Uh, you know, I found it hard to get employment even with education. It's just that my heart wasn't into it anymore. Uh, the fact that people telling you what to do all the time, you know, remind you of the military. I just wanted to be my own person. But uh, that's, that's all behind me. I, I, I'm much better now. I'm in a better place. It's just that I'm physically limited for a lot of things. And uh, unfortunately, this diabetes is one of them. There was a lot of things that was uh, happening in Vietnam and the spraying of Agent Orange and other chemicals. And, you know, we didn't know what the hell we were drinking from or what we were drinking, what was... You'd walk through an area and all the leaves are glazed with stuff on it. And also when it rains, all that stuff drips on you, off the leaves. We didn't know what it was. We just found that odd it was glazing like that. But uh, we get, you get accustomed to it. You put up with it because that's the least thing that's harmful to you at that time. You're just trying to stay alive day to day. At the end of my interviews, Art, I asked the veterans to give me a salute into the camera. Would you do that for me when I ask you from where you're seated? Yeah, okay. You okay? You see that in my films, you'll see why I do it. It's very done, done very gracefully, so if you don't feel comfortable, we won't do it, but it's up to you. I don't have a problem with that. Okay, great. Okay, sir, so right into the camera. Thank you. Go ahead. Perfect. Excellent.